Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, we're in the home straight. This is the uh, last session. Um, I think, uh, so uh, next up we have uh, Christian uh, Beck, who founded a company called Leap Legal and then uh, later InfoTrack, and really uh, personifies uh, the kind of story that we wanted to tell here today. This uh, conference is all about telling the, the untold stories of all of these great uh, Australian technology companies and, and, and how they got started. Uh, so if you haven't heard of uh, Leap Legal and if you haven't heard of most of the agenda, uh, today, then that is actually uh, us doing our job. So uh, I look forward to uh, Christian telling his story now. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we started a business selling software to small law firms. Um, lots of people have a perception about law firms that's not all that accurate. They watch a lot of TV shows and there's lawyers in very nice offices and big law firms and things like that. But one uh, movie did a really good analogy of what a small firm really looks like, which I'll just show you now. We don't have sand fucking here. kidding me. I cleared that tray three fucking times. Mr. Denuto. Yeah? Ron Graham, Hammersley and Laycock. Got your note during the week. Oh, uh, yeah. So that law firm um, when they made that movie, The Castle, they looked around for an office to shoot that shot and they found a law firm in a street of Melbourne close to where they were doing it. And all they did is they changed the name of it. Everything was exactly the same. Um, and that was that firm. And then a few years after they made that movie, that firm bought Leap. So it's a very, very good connection to what we're dealing with. Um, my dad was ran a small law firm and... He, um, he's probably a little bit like a De Dennis Donito himself, although he doesn't like me to refer to him like that. Um, but he sort of said to me when I was very young, he said, look, don't deal with lawyers. They're very difficult to deal with. You'll never make any money out of them. Um, and when I was 20 years old, it was... You always try to prove your parents wrong when they say things like that, and I was, worked very hard to try to, to make a viable business out of law firms. Um, today we've got two businesses. A couple of years ago, we split them into two. So we have Leap, um, and that has revenue of $43 million uh, annualised, um, and we have a growth rate of 28%. Um, InfoTrack, which is legal searching, it has revenue of $154 million, and it has a growth rate of 63%. Um, so those two businesses are both growing fast, uh, so sort of profitable businesses. I should say with InfoTrack, there is quite a lot of government fees that go through the legal searching. So if you take that out, the gross profit's 50 billion. So it probably sounds a little bit better than it really is on that side. But combined, they're probably um, sort of $93 million. Um, I also have two other businesses that I'm investing in. One is called Smokeball, which is also a new generation legal software platform. And another one called Cami, which has nothing to do with legal software. It's a camera, CCTV camera system, cloud-based, with a very innovative home alarm that we're just starting to sell worldwide. Um, and that's my first real forte outside of the legal industry. So I'm just going to go back to the start now. Um, so my father had a firm in Parramatta, and they mostly did conveyancing. And he had about 20 people working for him. And he'd, he was quite into computers, and he'd set up his own FileMaker database to automate conveyancing. So um, he had a legal accounting system, and there was quite a few around that you could buy. Um, but he set up the FileMaker system to do all the things that that accounting system wouldn't do for him, like uh, document automation, matter management, tracking all the parties in the matters, et cetera. Um, and he had these staff members using the system, but it was quite a lot of work for him to maintain. Often when lawyers write their own software, they tend to make some things about it really good, but they also have quite a lot of maintenance issues and training issues because there's sort of flaws in the design of the software. And that was really the situation. So he had a full-time person looking after that, um, and she eventually left, and it was pretty hard to find someone to kind of look after it. And I was, at the time, quite interested in computers, and I was using his computers at night, and, um, and he ended up seeing that and gave me the job to look after them. 
And then after a while, I started, to, I rewrote the system and then I started to rent it out to a few firms I knew around that I'd met over the years. Um, and then we had the company Perfect Balance. My dad bought this legal accounting system from that company. And what I, what happened was that they, their software was really good with ours because ours did everything, theirs sort of didn't. So they were quite keen to actually sell the product, which was lucky for me. And um, they went and sold, they probably sold about 15 law firms initially, which was, it's always hard to get the first few sales and they, they did a good job of that. Um, they were a company of probably about 10 people and it grew to about 20 people over a few years. And, and I was really at that time a one man band programmer. After a while, that relationship got to be a little bit to the situation where I wanted them to sell more and they weren't that interested in working that hard on that product. They were more interested in selling their own product. So I, I started selling it myself. And one of the problems back then, it only used to run on the Mac and there wasn't that many Mac law firms around. And the ones that were around typically had sort of fairly old computers. So you had to find them and then convince them to buy new computers before they could run the system. So that was difficult. But I had one really lucky piece um, in that there was a guy who used to be a salesman for this big company called LawPoint, and they used to sell legal searches to lawyers as an online system. And they had a, a database of all their, all their clients, and they knew whether they were Mac or PC, and he gave me the list of Mac clients, which was, he shouldn't have really done, it was a very big risk for him. Um, but it was very good for me, because then I, I spent the next few years really just pounding that list hard, I'd ring them all up, I'd go out and see them. A lot of them were in sort of country areas like Bathurst, Dubbo, Orange, and I, I would drive around, I would do the demo, and I would convince them to buy it, and if they said they wanted to buy it, I would come back later and do the installation and training, etc. cetera. Um, so it was, a, it was hard work, but I learnt a lot out of that. Um, I also realised after a while that, um, so I wasn't, when I started, took over my dad, I'd never been a programmer before. I'd really just left school. So the first program that I wrote was the first program I'd ever done. So it had all these problems in itself. And I'd also learnt a lot more about what a good system should do, because I learnt more about the legal industry. So I, I rewrote it, and it took a long time. Like, it took about three years to rewrite it and convert the clients to the new, um, the new system. But it was a very, very good thing in that that underlying technology is largely what's still used today, um, the structure of the database and that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, my dad's business uh, went bankrupt during that phase in that um, my dad was a little bit too entrepreneurial. And that was a bad thing for family. It was bad for me because I used to go out and tell people, look, if you mobile my software, you'll make a lot more money and it's a very efficient system. But to have my dad's firm go bankrupt using it was, was embarrassing. <laughs> um, and then um, the good thing, though, about that is that my sister was working for my dad. And then when his firm went broke, he persuaded her to come and work for me. And that was my first employer that I ever had. Um, and she was very, very good. She, used to, she was a legal secretary. She used to use the software. She was very good with customers. And she, she could do training. And later, she, she sold a few systems as well. Very good people person. And, um, and that was a really, really big boost for me. Um, they asked to do a shot of the office. So this was my office back then. Um, and I used to call it Sweet 16 345 Victoria Place on my business card. But in fact, it was actually a residential unit and I used to live there as well as <laughs> program from that location. Um, and I think that being a one-man band is, is, is interesting as well. Like I used to, whenever I used to go and see the law firms, I'd be the salesperson. I'd always say, if you want to buy it, we'll come back and do the training. We're here to help you on the phone. If there's anything wrong, we're always here for you kind of thing. And I'd always say, we, not I, because if you sort of say that and you say, I'll do this and I'll do that, and it sounds like a one-man band, you run into a lot of problems. So early on, it was very important to appear bigger than I really was. Um, my basic strategy back in those years as a programmer was that you, you get a, about six really good hours of programming a day, and, and I thought that if I, I spent six hours a day, six days a week, I could beat the competition, making the best software for the industry. There were some quite big companies. There's one company called Locus, had about 60 staff members. They had a big development team, and I was a one-man band. But I, 
I sort of figured that if I did that, I'd have a chance of succeeding. And it actually did succeed. And it was partly helped by a few things. Firstly, Locus was focused on legal accounting and I was focused on legal productivity. And it turned out that accounting became a bit of a commodity over the years because lots of companies were doing that. It's sort of easier to write a program for that. The productivity side, there was only two other companies doing that. And in the end, I was able to become better than them. And then because my software is pretty popular, it sold quite a lot, I could eventually put more and more money into it. Um, the other thing is I started on the Mac and, and then I went to the PC. And back in those days, a lot of people were programming in DOS and then going to Windows. And there's a lot of work in learning how to program in a graphical user interface. And I was lucky and I was using this technology called 4D that converted quite easily from Mac to PC, whereas the competitors were often having to go from DOS um, and that was hard. I also think my father's system was a good starting point. It did actually help me get going initially. In terms of how I funded it, there was a few ways. Um, I used to do contract programming. So I initially started charging $40 an hour, but every now and again I would get, you know, over the years I could ask a little bit more and I'd get like $100 or $120 an hour. And I did a few things. I wrote this ticketing system for dual food stores. I actually worked for McGrath Real Estate for about six weeks. I, I got fired from that contract, actually, so that, was, that wasn't good. <laughs> and I worked for this company called Intensity as well, which is those game systems. So I had a few interesting projects that kind of funded me a, a fair bit um, over that time. I was also looking after my dad's computers until his firm went broke, so he would pay me a little bit for that. And I had um, software maintenance, so I, I'd have a few clients, I had about between six and 20 clients in that initial period. They would pay me a little bit of a fee, and I would sell probably one or two systems a year, and I'd get a few thousand dollars from them. So that was the revenue side of the equation. Um, on the cost base side, it was always done very, very cheaply. I used to pay myself $20,000 a year, and I think it's one of those things, if you start off young, which I started when I was 20, you can sort of live off 20,000 and I find a lot of times if you get paid more than that, say you go to 100,000, it's very hard to go back to 20. But if you never move off from 20, it's actually livable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I lived and worked from this unit in Dremoyne that cost $180 a week and that sort of, you know, the style was because my cost base was so low, I didn't have to do all that much paid work, which meant that the overall sort of financial formula worked and I ha could actually spend a lot of time doing the programming which is what I really need to do. Um, I had one extravagance, that was my boat. Um, I had a third share in a boat that looks like this. Um, my friends used to call it the SS shitbox <laughs> and it used to, um, it was very, very kind of modest but was fun. Um, but that's probably the life of a kind of bootstrapping programmer staying in their own business. Um, a lot of times when people talk about bootstrapping, they talk about it in romantic terms, like it's something they're very proud of and all that, which I think there is some element of that, but I think it's also not necessarily that easy as well, and it, it depends a bit on how long it goes for. In my case, it went on for really nine years before I kind of got any real sort of scale of a business, and I, I was working 72 hours a week. I was living off $20,000 a year. I had a, enough clients where I couldn't really travel overseas or anything like that because there was no one to look after those clients. Um, and that was difficult. And I think that a lot of the time people have, you know, when they're trying to bootstrap a business, there's personal factors, like they might have a wife that, or they might have kids or a mortgage. And I think if you have any of those things, it's very, very hard to do. Um, and I think even if you have a girlfriend, in my case, um, I needed to to sort of not do the things that she really wanted me to do. We eventually bought a house together, um, and that cost 280, we bought a house in Hunters Hill, and it cost $280,000, so I had a 16,000 deposit to buy half it. Um, but she wanted to, you know, do it up, and I remember there's this big argument about bedside tables that I refused to go halves in. Um, <laughs> and eventually she, um, she left me, basically, and, um, <laughs> And, um, and that was, at the time, quite sad for me. Um, and I didn't obviously <laughs> expect that outcome. Um, 
But it was a really good thing financially because a lot of people in Sydney make a lot of money out of houses, and my house went up about 200 grand that period we had. So I actually got $100,000 from the house, which was very useful for the business. <laughs> It was also bad in a way too, because not only had I probably not treated my girlfriend well enough, I hadn't bought clothes for four years, because I had a girlfriend, I don't know who needs clothes. I was paying myself 20 grand. I'd ignored all my friends, and restarting life was challenging, but I kind of got that to, that $100,000 did sort of help in that, that way. Um, my dad also decided that he wanted to come and work in the business, so I got him to work part-time. Um, my sister was there full time. We found with my sister being a legal secretary, it was really good to sort of, that worked really well. So we employed another legal secretary. And that was really interesting because at the time it was me, my sister and my dad. And we, we had this sort of, every meeting was sort of a family meeting essentially then. Um, and we said to him, well, do we tell this person that we're sister, brother and dad? Or do we tell them, tell her that, look, we're just, Nothing, you know, don't tell our last names and just pretend that we're not a family. And um, because it was sort of a bit incestuous, the whole sort of situation. <laughs> and um, my mum, anyway, we decided in the end that we wouldn't tell her, right? Um, and she started, um, and she had to resign from a big law firm, come here, and then about a week later, my, fr my sister was very friendly with her, did a great job, and we told her, and she was okay with it, so that was a very big relief. Um, we started to expand into other areas of law by, we added the Law Society precinct, so they had a set of Word documents and forms that the lawyers wanted. They, they, they were not automated at all, and our software was good automation software. Putting those two together was a very powerful combination that lawyers liked, and that helped us sell quite a lot. Um, and we employed another legal secretary, and she was actually really good at selling, and she sold you know, way more than any of us had done before, and that really helped. We also started doing seminars um, at hotels. So we'd book a hotel room, we'd send out, put inserts in the Law Society Journal, where people would fax back and re reply to come along to that. And that, that actually as a marketing strategy worked really well. It was good for us too, because we didn't really have a, a proper office. We were working back then in the back of um, a law firm. They gave us four workstations in a sort of contra deal to we looked after their computers, they gave us free desks. Um, but we couldn't really bring f firms into the office and things like that. So that marketing method worked. Um, I actually, at that time, that was 1999, and I, I was approached by a very large company doing legal searching called LawPoint, and they wanted to buy us out, because uh, they were doing searching, and they wanted to give away the software to lock the clients into their overpriced searching, essentially. Um, so we went through this process and they were, um, it became difficult and in the end they sort of said to us, look, if you don't sell out, we're going to um, write this software and give it away for free. And they were backed by Telstra Venture Capital and it was pretty scary. So I kind of realised then I had to get into searching to offset that. Um, so we started that. Um, we also, in 1999, there's this great thing called Y2K because our biggest problem is <laughs> most lawyers um, had really old computers and they were very stingy with buying new ones and that was a big impediment for us selling the software. But when people were telling them that your computer is going to stop working on the 9th of the 9th, 99 at midnight, they all, many of them thought they should buy new computers and many of them want software with that. And that was a big boost for us. Our sales went from about 10 to 100 in the year. And the revenue went from about 250,000 to 1.2, made a 1.2 million profit, oh sorry, 200,000 dollars profit. Um, the staff also went from four to 16, so it was a really fast growth period that really got the business onto a good, good platform. Um, we were sort of flying high, although we were kind of still very tight with the money. I mean, I remember one of the biggest problems back then with office space. So we were leasing these four offices from this law firm. Eventually, they did start charging us for it. Um, but to get an office, you need to sign a lease. And normally, they're like um, you know, two or three year lease. You also have to put a bank guarantee down, which the bank won't give a start up to. So it's normally th six months. You may be able to get down to three months rent. But it's a lot of money. and. It was difficult. So I had this idea, there was a unit advertised in this building called Observatory Tower, 
and it was $1,000 a week rent, um, so about similar to what an office would have cost. It had four car spaces too, which is great. Um, and so we thought, well, there's only one month lease when you do residential. So we paid that one month bond, moved in there. And initially it was great. There was about six of us initially. Um, it wasn't, didn't quite look like that, but we had all desks and things like that everywhere. But the business grew really quickly from, um, from about six to about 18 people. And then we had a whole lot of problems. Like the concierge was wondering why there's all these people coming up. Because <laughs> you weren't really supposed to run a business in the building. Also, we had this searching business that was all done in modems back then, and we had our online updating system of precedence, our searching business, and the unit had 10 phone lines coming in. Originally that was fine, but soon became very not fine um, because all of these lines got exceeded. So we had to sort of get like a, a fake Telstra man to come in and take phone lines from the units next door and route them into our unit <laughs> and sort of solve that problem. And then, and then, that, was, that wasn't good, but um, <laughs> we, I, I bought a new car at that time. It was an Alfa Romeo, and um, it was fantastic, actually, considering a few things in my life back then. And um, it, was a, it was a really good time. We had a nice office. We had a few stresses, business growing fast, etc. But then normally when you have a big boom, you, it's followed by a bust. And in 2001, Y2K was over, so sales sort of halved, pretty much. We had a high cost base. Um, we were investing in leap searching and also a, an illegal accounting system at the time. The other thing is the tax department. It's something like provisional tax or something where if you've earned money one year, they think you're going to earn it the next year and you've got to pay it up, which surprised me and was very difficult. Um, also, that block of units, what had happened then is they, they had a whole a few other businesses running in that block of units and one of them was a brothel that they thought. So the, um, the strata people decided to kick all the businesses out, including us. So we had to get out of Observatory Tower, and that was expensive, and we did have to pay a lease in the end, etc. cetera. Um, and also my dad wanted to sell his shares. So all those things happened in a very quick succession in 2001. Um, and the rescue plan was the car got sold. Um, an employee, I had a really good employee who's still there today. And he bought my dad's shares, and he also lent the company $50,000, which was really, really life-saving. Um, and we just had a really a few years of being really, really tight with everything, and then we, we did get through that. Um, this was our first office, and it's one of the worst buildings in Sydney. Um, <laughs> it took us 10 years to get out of that building once we were in there. Um, and then we had a few investors. That employee that bought the shares, etc. Her mother, oh, sorry, his mother uh, decided to invest $300,000, which was amazingly good and allowed us to open up a Melbourne office and really get going. I also went to a conference um, on floating companies and I met this private equity, sorry, venture capitalist, and we were too small. His minimum investment was $5 million and the company was worth about a million at most, sort of thing. And, um, but eventually we persuaded him to put $150,000 of his own money into the company. Um, so that gave us sort of $450,000 investment, which really kind of got it to the next stage and it, it really went well from there. So just reflecting on why it worked. Um, firstly, we were very different to our competitors in that it was about 25 legal accounting providers and um, there was only two other legal productivity, so the, the document automation management side of it. And we became better than them and integrated to a few accounting systems. And that gave us a big sales boost and worked really well. What also happened with the searching side, when LawPoint sort of threatened us that they were going to compete with us and we came back and decided we had to do searching, it ended up that with the software, it's quite expensive to sell. Like it would probably cost you about, in terms of sales and marketing effort, about $6,000 per client to sell. And you'd probably only get about six grand back out of the sale. So it was a very unviable thing. But with searching, what happened is that when you sold it and got six grand for the software, and then another six grand a year out of the searching, then we end up getting really twice as much revenue per client as our competitors were. Um, and when you've got twice as much revenue client, you can pay twice as much in sales and marketing or you can spend a lot more in R&D. Um, 
And those sort of things over time make a big difference. So that, that formula of, of actually linking it and high revenue really made it successful. And since then, we did a whole lot of things and there's a whole next phase of the story which I don't really have time to talk about today, but we bought a lot of competitive businesses, we grew the revenue stream, we, we did price rises, we did a whole lot of things that made it into what it is today. So, thanks. Take a seat on the bench. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, going back to that time where you, you had those 10 sales a year where you were focusing mainly on uh, just developing the product. Looking back, uh, what mistakes did you make in terms of not speaking enough to customers or not selling enough? And, and how, how did the, even the, the 10 sales occur for you? Okay, so the 10 sales a year, originally it was me going out and selling to people, and then it was the legal secretaries I employed was selling. And I, I don't actually think there was a lot of mistakes there. I think that what was really good about that was if you go and sell to any business a product, they'll quickly tell you what they do and don't like about it. And I, I got a lot of knowledge about what the legal industry wanted selling directly. I used to go and train people on the software as well, and they talk all about sort of usability and things like that, but... Most programmers are very lazy. They don't like training. They're very lazy with that. And I used to be the same. And I used to watch how people use the software and change it so that it worked in what they'd intuitively do, mostly because then I didn't have to sit there and tell them what to do. They just knew how to do. And that, and that sort of formula of knowing the sales, knowing how the customers used it, made it actually a very good product. If you were to do the, the business again, would you found it as a solo founder or do you count, uh, say, your sister and, and your father almost as uh, that, that was a starting point in terms of the founders of the business? Well, I think the, my father and sister both had a significant contribution for sure and I think probably for me, I mean, there's a lot of years where I was out contract programming, writing the code and things like that where they weren't involved and I think that it... Um, I'd probably consider myself the founder, but they certainly helped. Yeah. Sure. And then um, the discovery of the uh, the searching business, was that always obvious as well from the clients in terms of them cobbling together different systems, or uh, was it primarily through this uh, competitive attention with LawPoint that uh, you stumbled upon this uh, great business, which really changed uh, your overall business model when selling two of the products instead of one? Sure. Look, it was completely in reaction to the law point threat, and they did threaten us very seriously, and we did um, sort of did acknowledge that it was a risk. So it was completely in response to that, but it was the best strategic thing we've ever done. And it's funny, I, I sort of find these things, I often think, if I look back, was I good at strategy? I wasn't. I was just reacted to the few things that happened um, like my dad's situation to start with and the program he wrote, I rewrote that, that was good. The link, the, the law point re responding to that threat was great and those things collectively were great strategic things but they weren't me sort of reading books about strategy or thinking about it, it was purely reacting to the circumstances that occurred. And, and you know, you mentioned uh, the, the Y2K uh, time and almost that being a, a sort of similar platform shift um, did sort of the big technology shifts like mobile, like uh, in the past few years, has that impacted the business or, or explain sort of more of the waves of uh, business that you caught uh, that, that gave the business uh, significant headwinds, uh, sort of tailwinds? Sure. Look, I think that Y2K was such a big boost for us. It just happened to hit us exactly the right time we really needed the growth, etc. I remember our sort of thinking, when is this going to happen again? And it was another thousand years, I think, so that was depressing. <laughs> but but I, I think with other technology shifts, um, I mean, these days we're right into mobile and I think there has been shifts, but and obviously the shift to graphical user interface was another shift, which we were lucky with. Um, but I think, to me, the, what Y2K was was just a big sales boost for a period of time, but it was very needed and we've never had anything like it ever before. Or ever since. Uh, one question from the audience is uh, this idea of law changing from a sort of 
billings, time basis uh, into fixed fee. Has that impacted the business or what's your sort of view on uh, how the legal industry itself is uh, changing in terms of its charging model? Sure. Look, I think with us, we, we don't sell to large law firms. We're very much in legal productivity. And what happens is large law firms tend to have big clients like BHP and things like that, and they'll tend to charge $800 an hour. And if you go into them and tell them that you're going to help them be more productive, they don't want to hear that, right? Because if you're charging $800 an hour, why would you want to go any faster? So, <laughs> so, so that doesn't work for us. Um, if you go to the small law firms, it's a different paradigm. They're kind of doing conveyancing family law estates for individuals. Um, and they are very price sensitive. Conveyancing is almost always fixed fee. Family law is not generally fixed fee, but what will tend to happen is, you know, if you can't bill forever on a divorce or something like that. There's a, there's a finite amount and the, the lawyer will tend to wear it if it goes too high. So the productivity in those sectors really do matter. And, We've only ever specialised in that kind of firm. Um, and I, I, I mean, people have been talking about all this change of billing for 20 years, but it hasn't changed hardly at all in 20 years. The big firms still bill by the hour, the small ones still do largely fixed fee. Uh, someone said uh, a wonderful bootstrapping story. Um, do you think that that was integral to your success, or do you think uh, raising capital earlier would have been uh, much better? Look, I think in some ways I was always wished I could have raised capital, um, but I do think that the way it ended up worked out well for me in the end. Um, but I think the, the problem really was at the time there was no... I didn't, I, I didn't know anyone that was sort of investing in money. I didn't know anyone else that was writing a program like this. It was sort of... I just ended up staying in this and I was... There just wasn't the community then. Like, this was a long time ago. It was 25 years ago. There wasn't the community like this. There wasn't the incubator. There wasn't the uh, VCs like Blackbird here, etc. And I think that there was no venture capital to, available to that sort of thing that I was aware of at the time. Talk, talk about uh, yeah, maybe the last question, uh, which is uh, who are the, the people in business that you learnt uh, the most from mentors, uh, books, uh, other businesses that you admired? Um, how did you learn uh, sort of the process of becoming a great entrepreneur? Look, I'll give you one example, and it's probably not what you'd expect, but um, I remember once with our software, we were always really cheap with our software, and we weren't doing a particularly good job, and there was a real need to probably charge more and do a better job, but there was a lack of, I had a lack of confidence in doing that, and I think that I remember a friend of mine gave me this letter from a, a company that did vet software. It's called RxWorks. It's still around today. And it was basically an argue, a letter to their clients after a whole lot of clients have complained about a really big price rise. And I kind of looked at them and I thought about that and I went back to their site six months later and they're expanding overseas and doing very, very well, etc. And I thought, to, and I was doing price rises then and you write a letter to these law firms and it might be a... 5% price rise, and they'd all hate you and it'd be very difficult and all that. And I sort of thought one year, I thought, well, if I do 30%, they're probably still going to hate me, but at least I'll be a rich guy that people hate rather than a poor guy that people hate. <laughs> so I, I tried that, and then um, progressively those price rises got much bigger, and we probably charge eight times now what we used to back then, but we do a lot better job. We are going overseas, and everything's really good. So I think probably... That sort of influence on pricing was probably, if I'm honest about it, the most helpful thing that I had in those early years. Ladies and gentlemen, thank Christian. And also uh, keep clapping and, and thank yourselves for uh, coming along today. We really, really do appreciate it. I think uh, the only travesty is if uh, you don't do something different tomorrow. So hof uh, hopefully you've learnt a lot uh, from the, the wide and varied speakers of today. Uh, but it's only going to make a difference if you take uh, that knowledge, if you try something different in your own business. Um, or if you haven't started a business, hopefully uh, you've recharged your batteries on the inspiration to, uh, to give it a go. 
Uh, the applications for our accelerator start mate uh, open in a few months, so hopefully you consider uh, if you are starting a company uh, applying to that as well. Um, I want to thank also uh, our partners. Uh, we don't call them sponsors because they are true partners in, in helping this day uh, run as well and, and to be as big uh, as it is. Uh, so Google and Amazon Web Services, um, a big, big thank you. And if everyone can uh, give them a big clap. I think, uh, so also Bill, Rick and I uh, uh, were truly, truly inspired. So we're, we're going to uh, personally give uh, $1,000 to both uh, Poppy, who you uh, heard speak uh, on her helping uh, with her skateboarding travels, and then also uh, to sponsor a team in the first robotics uh, competition as well. If you would like to join us, uh, you can email me uh, at uh, Nikki, N-I-K-I, at blackbird.vc. Uh, we can uh, all bundle it up together, but uh, at least uh, Poppy and the uh, first robotics teams in Australia will be $1,000 richer each. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back next year, so we hope you can uh, join us for that. And thank you so much for today. Cheers. Cheers.